Hello, I'm Mark, and this is In the Round on Armature Bus Tutorial Series, Part 14, Removal, Hollowing, and Reassembly. Having fully developed all of the masses of the head, shoulders, and hair, it is time to remove the bust from its armature for hollowing and reassembly. This will allow you to fire the bust, making it permanent. If, on the other hand, you intend to make a mold and cast your bust, then you can now proceed to Part 15, Final Detailing. Removal can be a traumatic process the first time you do it, because it requires cutting up the sculpture you've labored over for days or weeks or even months. But don't worry, it'll be fine. The cuts we make will be easy enough to rejoin and sculpt over, and if unintended cracks do appear, they too can be repaired. Indeed, once you're comfortable with the process, cutting up a figure can be quite fun. Before proceeding, make sure that the outer half-inch or so of clay is at least leather hard. If the clay is still soft at the surface, then you'll need to let it dry out a little, or you can force dry it with a heat gun or hair dryer. Just make sure the drying is even across the bust, and be careful not to let protruding features like the nose, ears, or tips of the hair dry out too much. If the clay starts to get dusty and dry looking, you've gone too far, and should delicately rehydrate the affected part with a spray bottle. Once you're confident the clay is in a good state for removal, it's time to decide on where to make your cuts. The objective here is to divide the bust into the most stable, manageable pieces you can, while causing the least damage possible to difficult to resculpt features like eyes and ears. It's also important to consider how accessible the interior is, both for hollowing and for running the seams during reassembly. Sometimes it can be convenient to follow sculptural features in the bust, like overhangs in the hair or folds in draped cloth, but it's more important to ensure that each piece terminates in at least one flat edge so that you can put it down without it deforming under its own weight. Where you cut will depend on a number of factors, including the pose, the hair you've articulated, the shoulders or base you've decided on, and on whether or not you've already detected any cracks forming, for example in the neck when you pose the bust. If, for instance, the neck is thin and the base large, it's probably best to cut at the neck as it's likely to break there anyway during hollowing. If, on the other hand, the hair spans the neck, thickening and strengthening it, it may be possible to safely cut the bust vertically into two halves. The two most common locations for dividing a bust are, one, in front of one ear and behind the other, either all the way down to the base or to the neck where an additional cut can be made, and two, around the crown, again with or without an additional cut at the neck. You can, if you wish, also cut the base in half at the sternum and spine, as it's a safe cut and can make it easier to hollow out the shoulders, but it's not usually necessary. In general, it's better to make more cuts rather than to risk hollowing pieces that are too unwieldy for you to handle. You decide where to cut, but a mishandled piece can crack anywhere. When you're ready, mark the cut lines. Double check that they're as straight as possible around the form. Remember that you want the pieces to have a flat edge so that you can put them down without torquing them. There are a number of methods you might use to ensure that your cut lines are straight. For horizontal cuts, like at the neck, you can measure up from the base, or hold the tool steady and rotate the bust. For coronal plane cuts, you can use a string tacked on with a bit of soft clay. For the round crown cut, you can use a bucket. You can use plumb lines or squares for vertical cuts, though these are the easiest to eyeball. To make the cuts, I'd recommend using a short, stiff-bladed, serrated knife. Some people favor a wire tool, as its low friction allows it to move more smoothly through the clay, but I find it can be hard to keep a line with a wire. Use a short, rocking motion and move the knife slowly. Pull the pieces apart, cutting the bag if necessary. Make sure you cut deeply, all the way down to the armature. If you haven't divided vertically down to the base, you'll have to pull the bust up off the armature. Using a large, rounded, serrated loop, start hollowing around the armature until you can grasp the armature wire. Try to pull it out. If you can't, hollow some more and try again. You may have to snip the binding wire. Once you remove the armature wire, the bust should come up over the pipe with relative ease. If you find that you really can't get the armature wire to come out, compress the egg beater down as much as possible and pull the bust up over it. Note that, in this instance, I've chosen to make this additional cut at the base, both for easier access to the complex interior of the hair and so that you can better see what's going on inside the pieces as I hollow them.
Now that the bust is off the armature, clear your workspace, putting your turntable to the side. Hollowing is a messy process and, as you recall, clay dust is toxic, so you'll want to keep the mess as contained as you can. Start with large, rounded, serrated loops, then move to smaller and smaller loops as you approach the final thickness of the shell, which should, ideally, be a uniform half-inch or so all around. This will, in practice, be difficult, but do your best, because variations in wall thickness can cause deformation in the firing. Even more importantly, make sure that you don't leave any parts of the wall thicker than an inch and a half or so, or you'll risk it exploding during the firing. It's actually possible to fire far thicker than this, but it requires a particular firing schedule. For most standard firings, under an inch and a half should usually be safe. Usually. If there are any spots you're worried about, you can poke some holes in the interior with a needle tool. Just don't poke all the way through the wall. Places to pay particular attention to are the chin and around the jawline and in the shoulders. Don't worry too much about hollowing the nose as it protrudes from the surface of the bust and so shouldn't have any problems releasing its moisture. If you're having difficulty moving the loop through the clay, try either a scooping motion, like you're using a melon baller, or a wiggling motion, sawing as you cut. Be very careful around the eyes and the corners of the mouth. It is very easy to carve through at these points. It's safer to make many small removals rather than fewer large ones. If you do carve through, which is likely, especially if you're working with complex hair, or if the wall is just getting too thin, work some clay into the interior to reform and re-thicken it, then re-sculpt the exterior. Throughout the hollowing process, try to keep your fingers opposite the tool. You will be able to feel the vibrations of the tool passing through the clay and will learn how to gauge its thickness based on that feedback. If the piece you're working on starts to get floppy, it means it's getting too thin for the current moisture in the clay. Just put it to the side to stiffen up and work on hollowing another part. Move slowly and be responsive to what you feel happening in the clay. Once all the pieces are hollow, it's a good idea to compress the interior wall, which will strengthen it and minimize deformation in the firing. Alternate between a moist scouring pad or reticulated foam and a flexible metal or rubber rib. Use your fingers for places the tools are too large to access. If the pieces start to get too moist to hold their shape, just put them aside and let them stiffen up. Now is also a good time to thicken the bottom rim, or foot, of the bust with a fat coil of clay on the interior. This coil will minimize deformation at the base and will also make for a cleaner end to your sculpture. It's an important detail that beginners often overlook. Work it in thoroughly, compressing and smoothing it. When all the pieces are hollowed, compressed, and leather to hard leather hard, check to see if they still fit back together. If they don't, adjust accordingly. Decide on the order of reassembly, taking into consideration access to the interior and your ability to handle the pieces. Here I'll be attaching the crown first, so that I can easily reach the inside of the seam through the neck. Before you begin the reassembly, make sure you've prepared coils of soft clay and plenty of smooth slip. See my video, The Remains of the Clay, for how to make slip. If you wish to score the edges, you may. This will improve their grip on each other, minimizing the possibility of them slipping when you press them together. Though axiomatic in clay processes, scoring isn't strictly necessary and can actually lead to weaker seams if you don't thoroughly work slip into the grooves the scoring creates on the edges. Of greater importance is that the pieces you're joining have equal moisture, and that you use enough slip to completely fill the seam. Firmly press the pieces together so that the slip squeezes out all around. Lay a coil along the seam. Work your way around in one direction, pressing it in as you go and pushing out excess slip in the process. Work the coil in either direction out from the seam, blending it into the walls, first with your fingers, then with abrasion tools. Run the interior of the seam in the same way, then use a flexible rib to compress the interior wall until the seam and surface are uniform. A serrated metal rib followed by a smooth rubber rib is particularly good for this. 
Once the seam is established, check that the bust wasn't deformed in the process, flexing it back into shape if necessary. I'll next join the two halves of the base. I'll then let the head and shoulders sit up a bit before joining them at the neck. Note that if there are large gaps in the seam, you can use a sticky soft coil of clay laid along the edge instead of slip to help you bridge them. I'll work the interior of that seam only after the bust is set up enough for me to lay it down on a piece of foam. Once the bust is back together, you can start to roughly shape the seams back into conformity with the overall sculpture, but do so delicately. Before the seams reach their full strength, the moisture in them will have to equalize with the moisture in the surrounding walls, which can take several days. When you're ready to wrap the bust, be sure to do so first in cloth, then in plastic, so that condensation doesn't pool anywhere. Be careful of excess moisture in general. Hollowed busts are susceptible to collapse if they get too wet. See my video Wrapping Up for more on wrapping work for stasis or controlled drying. Throughout the final detailing and drying processes, continue to check and recheck the seams to ensure that they're sound. If any start to separate, or if you find any cracks in the walls, you can work slip into them, then sculpt over them with wet clay. It may fix the problem, or it may not. If you do attempt this kind of repair, be sure to thoroughly work the fresh clay into the walls around the crack. However, if you were careful when you made the seams and gave them sufficient time for the moisture in them to equalize, you shouldn't run into any problems. Next, in part 15, the last part of this series, I'll cover finishing and final detailing.